As a cannabis producer, um, I'm often asked, well, what's it take to get into this industry? What's it take to uh, know how to cultivate? What's everything I need to know about how to make products? And so I've been asked this question so much, I've decided to put it into one slide. And so I'm gonna briefly go through today the cannabis industry. So when we very first start, we're gonna talk about growing flour and we're gonna talk about growing the various things that are necessary to produce product. We start with new mothers. Now, from new mothers, you have several different places that you can go. It goes into a vegetative state, and ultimately vegetation is determined by how many hours of light versus how many hours of dark that you have. And then you can take it from a vegetative state into a flowering state by changing that profile. Now, in order to get to this place, ultimately you can use seeds. Seeds are awesome because uh, nationally, you can move them across all state borders. There's no issues with moving seed around because at the point of seed, it has no THC in it. However, one of the challenges with seed is you get variations in genetics. And so one of the things that you look for in a uniform crop is you wanna look out, they should all be about the same height. Your flower density should look about the same. Everything should be uniform. When you use seeds, you get all kinds of differences. And this is where we talk about phenotypically being different. Phenotype is when something looks different, whereas when we talk about genotype, it means that it's genetically different from something. Typically, most of the industry uses clones, where that's where you actually take a mother and you actually cut off some of the mother and then you plant it, and then ultimately it will turn into a new plant. Clone is the most common way to get uniform distribution, but you can also create through tissue culture. Tissue culture is particularly interesting because you can take multiple strains and start to splice genetics. And this is particularly where you get geno hunting and pheno hunting being particularly interesting for creating new strains. In the medical market, which is particularly interesting, you're wanting to get a diversity of cannabinoids. Traditionally right now, most medical cannabis typically is just THC. And it's all ranging from somewhere between 14 and about 30%. Now, some stuff is higher, but on average, you're looking for about 20%. Now, that's just THC. We're not getting uh, inflammation effects without CBG. We're not getting better sleep effects with CBN. So ultimately, as we start to think about tissue culturing, this is how we start blending new various strains together to get something else. Once we get it through the flowering stage, we then go to harvest. Now, harvesting then can lead over here to doing fresh frozen. So at fresh frozen, this is where you start making rosins and various other products that people like. You basically will do a trichome knock. Those are the little chemical factories that are on the plant. You knock off those trichomes and then ultimately you can press them. Now you can do cold pressing or hot pressing. Typically when you do a hot press, that's where you get the live rosin. The live rosin is a honey color. It's beautiful. A lot of people like that and they like the qualities associated with it. From there, you can go ahead and label and package. Also, the other thing that you get out of this stage is obviously the flour that you're going to smoke. What you don't use as far as flour, you then we're gonna take into biomass. And biomass consists of drying it down. You're gonna to wanna to get about 0.65 water activation. Ideally, that's the best water activation level that you want. Um, if it's too dry, it's not gonna be a pleasant uh, flour. It's not gonna be a pleasant uh, biomass ultimately because um, you're gonna wanna retain some of the terpenes. So you end up evolving terpenes when you dry, uh, when you dry it too much. Uh, we'll talk about terpenes more in a little bit in terpene recovery. But ultimately you end up with trim. Trim can be mixed with uh, small buds that are small, too small to be used in normal packaging. Anything smaller than popcorn can get mixed with trim. This trim has to be with actual trichomes on it. It can't just be leaf and stem. It has to be actually sugar leaf. And then those can be blended together and also be turned into packages. In the case of like Zion, we call that tumbleweed, where we make very small flour and we grind up that flour and make a product called tumbleweed. From biomass, ultimately, you're gonna take it over to extraction. Now extraction has multiple ways you can do this. You can use ethanol. The most common way to do this is probably ethanol. Most people um, don't want to spend the money associated with ethanol. And so they will get something called denatured ethanol. That's a problem. 
If you're gonna do this, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's food grade ethanol, 100%. And if you have a good solvent recovery system, you'll end up getting your ethanol back and so it doesn't cost as much. Ethanol is effective for almost all kinds of plant extraction. So you like lavender, uh, vanilla, almost any plant you can think of, you can extract with ethanol. And you can do that at home, quite frankly, with a fifth of vodka and a mason jar. But um, ultimately, a lot of people also use CO2. The biggest difference is, you know, a lot of CO2 units right now can do somewhere between 34 and about 60 pounds a day. I can get done in a very small ethanol machine around 600 pounds a day. And so your ability to do uh, volume changes significantly. There's other unique ways to do this. We have a proprietary way we also do extraction. I'm not gonna cover that today, uh, but a lot of people also like hydrocarbon. Traditionally in the cannabis industry, you choose an extraction method to based on the type of product that you want. Now, people will use hydrocarbons specifically for butters, waxes, and a whole bunch of uh, dabs, things like that. Um, whereas ethanol almost always will result in making distillate. Um, here's what I would tell you. People have done that because that's the way it was traditionally done. It doesn't have to be that way. You can make a dab or a wax out of ethanol or CO2, just like you can from hydrocarbon, right? And one of the challenges that you run into is no matter what extraction technique you do, it needs to be clean, it needs to be good, you want, if this is not a buyer beware issue. This is simply, especially in Utah for medical patients, this needs to be clean. You need to get out whatever solvent you put in. So this is extremely important. Okay, so if you go to hydrocarbon, you're basically doing a solvent purge after that. You can form your product, your wax, your butter, whatever it is, label and package and sell it. There's a couple other things you can do. You can press it, you can mold it, you can do a couple other things. Typically with ethanol and CO2, you're gonna to have to winterize. Winterizing is literally, you take your alcohol suffused uh, crude oil, and then you're gonna put a certain amount of ethanol into it, and then you're going to get it cold. What happens is, just like putting a handle of vodka in the freezer, it doesn't freeze. You have very cold alcohol. Same thing happens here. When you start to freeze your crude oil, your fats and your waxes will start to separate. You don't wanna be smoking those. You don't wanna eat those. They're not good for you. We wanna get all the, the cannabinoids out, but leave the waxes behind. So that winterization process will start to separate those. And sometimes if you're using like CO2, CO2 is extremely efficient at getting cannabinoids, but you pull out everything. Basically your biomass afterwards like sawdust. But that means you have every fat, every protein, every lipid, everything you can possibly imagine comes out with CO2. So sometimes you have to winterize multiple times. The proper temperature for winterization, you can do it at minus 20, but ideally you wanna be somewhere between minus 40 and minus 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, that just cuts down your total time. Okay, so in order to, if for, to winterize, you're gonna to have to have solvents. So some people will say things like, CO2 is solventless and is perfectly clean. In order to winterize, you have to add solvent in, otherwise there's nothing to separate the fats and the waxes away from the cannabis oil. So you're always adding solvent back to do winterization. After you freeze it, you filter out all those fats, and now we're at a point where we're gonna do solvent recovery. So no matter what solvents you use in any of the process, this becomes extremely important. If you don't get the right solvent recovery, you don't wanna leave hydrocarbons on your material. Nobody wants to eat those, nobody wants to smoke those, nobody wants to have a whole bunch of pentane or butane or anything else in their products, or ethanol for that matter. So you wanna go ahead and get a solvent recovery. Different machines have different efficiencies for doing that. Um, typically, most people use a rotovap, but there's several other ways to do it. During this period after solvent recovery, you either can go directly to decarboxylation or you can go to terpene recovery. So this is an interesting place. So just like you have a, a massive amount of crude oil and you start heating that crude oil up, what will happen is if you have alcohol left in there or some type of solvent, it won't get above that temperature until after all that solvent is gone. So let's say in the case of alcohol, 76 degrees. It will never get above 76 degrees until all the alcohol's out. If there's water left over, it won't get above 100 degrees. No matter how much energy you put in, 
it'll stop at 100 degrees till the water's out. All your various terpenes have different vaporization temperatures. And so what ultimately can happen is you can collect those terpenes at the right temperatures. And so you want cannabis derived linalool? Guess what? You can do that as long as you know what the vapor pressure or the vaporization temperature for linalool is. And so that's a really cool way. You just need a piece of equipment and a cold finger to catch those. Anyway, afterwards you want to do decarboxylation. Decarboxylation is extremely important. This is literally just removing basically a COOH off the molecule. You don't need to remember that. But the thing that becomes important about it is it evolves in the form of CO2. So uh, if anyone's ever had a pot brownie, for example, and they didn't cook it hot enough, you didn't get high ultimately from that pot brownie. And the reason why is because they didn't decarboxylate it appropriately. In the brownie, you can tell if it's been decarboxylated because you'll have all these little potch marks on the top of the brownie on the skin. That's where the CO2 is coming out. It's the same thing when you're smoking or anything else. The reason you light it on fire and inhale it is because you're ultimately decarboxylating it with fire. You're getting off that CO2, right? None of them will be able to pass through the blood brain barrier until they've been decarboxylated. And we can go through that on some other time. After that, we have distillation. Distillation has multiple ways you can do it. Everything from short path to falling film to um, first pass, second pass, multiple pass. Some people hot pot it. Basically, this is an old school method. A lot of times, people who don't want to spend a lot of time working on this whole side will take a crude oil directly here. And the way that they mediate or get rid of color that's not necessary or what they don't want or smells is they'll put things like activated charcoal, kitty litter, all kinds of horrible things into these pots. And as you pour your crude through it, it will remediate the smell and color and then distill out the oil. What's the challenge with that? Well, obviously you could get chemical interactions going on when you're using these activated or chemically active compounds with your distillate. Um, typically speaking, I like to do a first pass and a second pass. The first pass is literally designed to pull off light oils. Cannabinoids are medium chain triglycerides, so they're all medium oils. And then you do a second pass to pull off all your heavies. After that, you can actually use it to make everything. At this point, you can do distillation to make vape pens. You can do gummies. You can do all kinds of different things with it. But let's say you wanted to take it to the next level and you wanted something that's 99.99% .99 pure, which is probably appropriate when we talk about making medicine. Now we go to isolation. So when you do isolation, there's several ways to do this. You can use um, fractional distillation. You can use chromatography. You can use um, solvent isolation, where you basically put it into a giant vat and you can use ethanol or pentane and get it cold really quick and your molecules will separate out from other uh, molecules and you make basically a birthday cake. That's what it looks like. That's all done. It's basically crystallized forms of cannabinoids. Although interestingly enough, THC doesn't crystallize like that. So you can't isolate doing that with that, but you can with CBD, CBG, some of the others. Okay, and then you can do further conversions and you can use ethanol, you can use hydrocarbons like pentane to do isolation, um, or you can use heat, light, and energetic oxygen. Ultimately, how do we get THC to turn into CDN? Heat, light, and energetic oxygen. That's how that works. So after that, you have isolated products. Now you can, you are isolated cannabinoids. You can form products, label, sell and package. And that's the process. Anyone who wants to get into this should know how to do all of it. And that's what you attest that you can do when you sign up for a license, when you apply. You say, I understand all of this and can do all of it. All right. Thanks, everybody.